Hey, we're really glad to be with you today. Um, God has already met us and helped us a, a bunch today, and I am, I am so filled with faith and encouragement for what He's going to do. But before we get on to that, today is Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Yeah? Come on. Let's hear it for the mamas. Now, two or three of you college students are like... Oh, no. Right? And right now, right now, I will, I will give a special pastoral dispensation. You may use your phone at this time to try and dig yourself out of the hole that you have just discovered you are in. Um, but no, seriously, happy Mother's Day to all the moms in the room. Um, we want to, the scriptures say, outdo one another in showing honor. Right? The scriptures also say, uh, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long, that it may be well with you. Now, listen, I recognize that in 2017, we've, you know, we're, we're about a decade into pop psychology that teaches you to find everything wrong about you and then figure out a way that that's actually your parents' fault. Um, and, uh, y- you know, th- that may or may not be true, but I- even if it is, the scriptures still say, honor your father and your mother. You see, the reason that we show honor is not because necessarily everyone to whom we show honor is always 100% honorable, but because God has shown us honor by sending us His Son, Jesus. God has bestowed upon us a grace and a mercy and a kindness and a blessedness and honor that we, we, we can't necessarily in any way even think about trying to deserve or earn or pay back. So we honor our parents as, as the source of our life, not because they were always perfect, because goodness knows if that's the case, then you just wait till you have kids. <laughs> And we honor them because the Scriptures say this is a good and right and proper thing for God's people to do, to show honor. Now, I also want to recognize that, you know, for some of you, the, this day is, is maybe bittersweet because maybe this is the first, son, you know, the first uh, Mother's Day without mom or without grandma or uh, may, maybe, um, maybe motherhood, just the idea that or something just causes pain for you. And we, we want to acknowledge that and just say we love you, we're here for you, we want to walk beside you and, and hold you up. But even as we do... We want to show honor where it is due. And so today, it, it's a good thing for God's people to, to bless our mothers. And so what I want to do today is, is we're going to pray for our moms. If they're here, if they're not here, we're going to pray for them. Um, and then on your way out today, mamas, we've got a gift we would love to give you and put in your hand. It's really cool, uh, but I'm not going to tell you what it is so that you will want to go get it. Um, see? Smart like that. Um, so let, let's pray. Father, thank you for the gift of our mothers. Thank you, Lord, for the ways they have... Um, the way they've served us and blessed us. And thank you, God, that we, uh, we have life because someone mothered us. Someone, someone delivered us. Someone brought us to terms. Someone fed us. Someone helped us. We bless those women today. We bless the mothers and the stepmothers and adoptive mothers and grandmothers. We just speak a blessing over them and pray, God, that you would so fill them with your spirit that everything that you've called them to do in their roles as moms, in their roles as grandmoms, in their roles as step and adoptive moms, we pray, God, that they would be able to fulfill their role, their duties before you as delights offered up unto Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, and empowered unto His grace. We love you. We bless them. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, well, today, uh, we, we are going to baptize some folks, and it's going to be really fun. Uh, because of that, we're going to take a little detour off of our regularly scheduled program. We, uh, we've been in this teaching series called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, which has been uh, really helpful to me personally. I hope it's been helpful to you, but it's definitely been helpful to me to, uh, to begin to invite Jesus into some of my emotional unhealth, and so uh, that, that's been uh, just a fascinating experience so far in and around our church. And really, if you are engaging that for the first time, never a better time to get in a group, ever. You know, even as the pace of our city kind of slows down as we go into summer, there's never been a better moment to just say, all right, God, I, I want you to come and help me. And so th- that would be a great thing for you to do. But today, we're actually going to turn our eyes to two of the most important verses in all of the New Testament, Romans 1. 16 and 17. Because before we baptize folks, we, it's really important that we understand why. It's really important that we understand what this means. It's really important that we understand what the gospel is. It's really critically important that we see this as a response of faithfulness to our faith in Jesus. So, join me, if you will, in Romans chapter 1. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for the salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. For as it is written, the righteous 
shall live by faith. God, would you bless the reading of your word? Would you bless the study of your word? Holy Spirit, just as you, uh, like 2,000 years ago, inspired the Apostle Paul to pen these words, would you come now in your presence to illuminate them, to make them come alive to us, God, to apply them to our hearts and to cause us to grow in our faith? In Jesus' name, amen. So speaking of faith, I came to faith uh, at the age of 12. Uh, I was invited to go to a camp by my buddy, just a school friend, and, um, and, and things were not awesome in my house uh, at the time. This was, not, this, was, this was one of the darker periods of my, my, my parents' lives together as their marriage was crumbling, and it was, just, it was just not a fun place to be. But you know how when you're really young and you're raised around some dysfunction, you can't really voice it. You just know you don't like it right? And so my friend says, hey, come to camp. And I just said, yes, yes. I mean, I, I didn't ask what kind of camp. It could have been an Al-Qaeda training camp. I don't know. I would have just said yes. I just would have, yes, yes, we're going. Let's go. Here I go. Um, and, and thankfully, it was not, it was not that. Um, otherwise, this would be a very different church. Uh, it, was, it was a Christian camp. And, um, and it was great in all the ways camps are great. And it was cheesy in all the way camps for kids are cheesy. But there was, there was, there was a moment uh, where the, the pastor who was giving, you know, a message every evening uh, was, was simply explaining the gospel. And he was explaining the, the good news that Jesus had lived perfectly and that he had died as a substitution for me in my place for my sin, just like Old Testament sacrifices were substitutionary but imperfect. Jesus was perfect. He was really beginning to unpack these, you know, basic truths of the gospel for me. And then he said, you know, on the third day he rose, and now the tomb is empty, and Jesus is alive, and he sent the Holy Spirit into the world, and so your response to that must be faith. And if you haven't personally trusted Jesus and, re- and, and embraced this news as good news for you, then it won't be effective for you. And then he sent us home. <laughs> he likes, it was a very secure move on the part of a camp pastor. Um, he was like, just go back to your rooms. And so I was like, all right, I'm walking back to my room. And I was re- just kind of realized, I've never done that. I've never taken the, the news of the gospel and responded to it personally with faith. Now, faith, I have to unpack this for a minute. The Bible word faith is from a set of Greek words, pistuo. Anyway, faith, belief, trust, they're all, we have three different words in English, but they're all the same word in Greek, okay? So typically we say, oh, my faith saved me, I believe in faith, but we don't have a verb for faith, so we just say trust or believe. I I don't know, maybe we should make faith. I'm going to faith God. I don't know. Maybe it's a thing. We should, I'm going to trust God, I'm going to believe God, but it's all the same concept. And I realized that I had done none of it. I'd never personally trusted that this news was good news for me. But I did that day. And from that moment, my life was not like that at all. (laughs) It was not like, whoop, you know, uh, sometimes some of you have a testimony where you gave your life to Christ, God did a miracle, and it's just been up and to the right since then. God bless you. That was not my story. Uh, I came to faith, and then I came home, and, you know, back home, it wasn't awesome. And, and for many years, it wasn't awesome. And I was trying to follow Jesus, but, you know, I was also, you know, trying to be a, a teenager, a cool teenager. You see how that turned out, um, right? And it just, it just, yeah. And so my faith journey looked more like an EKG than it did like a really good stock, right? And, and, and yet God was faithful to me. God, God was faithful to bless me and help me and hold me fast in response to my childish and childlike faith. And then through my journey, God, God really helped me. Uh, you know, I became older. I, I met my wife and uh, became part of a really great church. God ended up calling us into ministry. We were at the Every Nation Campus Conference. I don't know if any of you guys are there. It was amazing. All of you college students should go next year. It's awesome. But just, you know, buyer beware, God will change your life. And he did for me. Um, we went. God spoke to us about going into ministry, about planning churches. And, and my response was one of faith. Like, yes, yes, I want to say yes to God. I want to go do what he's called me to do. And then, I don't know if you've ever said yes to God and realized that that also involves some other things, right? So you open the brochure that you sign the front of, you're like, yes! And you open, you realize, oh, ministry in other nations where there isn't any ministry pays nothing. Oh, uh, how are we going to do that? And God just began to meet my needs, meet our needs. Uh, you know, th- hey, by the way, you're going to have to raise hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to go and do this thing. That God, but God's, God did it. 
God did it. And through that, a couple of new churches got started. A campus ministry was birthed. People came to faith in Jesus. We baptized a lot of folks. God called Hope and I back to the United States to, to plant this church. And, you know, I don't know, seven years ago, we moved here. And Pastor Donnie moved here. And what started with nine people on my couch in my living room about a mile over there has become the thing in which you find yourself this morning here in Boston and in Providence, Rhode Island. That's awesome. I'm really grateful for that. God has done amazing things in response to faith. Faith. And so, I, I, what I really want you to understand this morning is that the, the journey of faith, our, our lives are, are meant to be lived and begun by faith toward faithfulness. By faith and toward faithfulness. So, to the text, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for in it the power of God is revealed for salvation, salvation to everyone who believes. So, we're just going to walk through this text because here he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Most of you in here are Christians because it's a Sunday and we're in a church, right? And, and most of you who've become Christians have probably at some point, though you started by faith, have tried to keep going by really hard work, by trying harder, by doing better, by finding that spouse, or just by rebelling. At some point, you unhitched your wagon from faith in the gospel, and you began to try and get this thing done on your own somehow. Maybe for you, you, I don't know, rebelled and turned away. Maybe for you, you just began to work really hard and stress out about stuff that God told you to chill out about. Maybe instead of submitting things to the Lord in prayer, you decided to just get them done and drive them through. All of these features of the Christian life that are not done in faith are actually acts of saying to God, I don't really trust you. I'm not really sure that you're good or that you're powerful enough to do what you said you would do with regards to me, with regards to my life, et cetera, et cetera. On some level, we've either become ashamed of the gospel or simply decided that there's better news somewhere else. And I would love to be a vehicle this morning to appeal to you. No, no. Come back to your first love. Paul wrote to the church in Galatia, or in Galatia who has bewitched you? Who tricked you? Who, who, who told you some other gospel because you started in faith, but now you're like doing all this other stuff as if those were the things that really made it happen for you, men and women of God. But I'm here, Paul would say, to tell you that what started in faith ends in faith, and everywhere in between is all by faith. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Because this gospel, this good news is powerful. We can't be ashamed of this good news that has started our journey in Jesus. So for those of you who are men and women of God in here today, but you find yourself like the, the embers of your passion for Jesus cooling and dying down, let me tell you what will not fan into flame love for God is, is, is hard work, is feeling really bad. It's just getting it done. Volunteer for two more teams and trying to achieve your way back into God's good graces. The only way you receive God's good graces is by faith. That's the only thing you can do with gifts is just take them and then wrap them and then have them. Like how weird would it be if like my seven-year-old this Christmas came down, opened all of his toys and then was suddenly like, all right, dad, how much do I owe you? I'd be like, you know, a couple hundred bucks. No, I wouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> wouldn't do that, right? That'd be weird because they're gifts. This, this story of what God has done in Jesus Christ, living the first and only perfect human life and then dying in our place, receiving the hell that we deserve and then overcoming that by the power of the Holy Spirit to new life so that, and now inviting us to trust that's good news and it's good news that can only be received by faith word faithfulness. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it's the power of God for salvation. Some of you in here, you're, man, filled with shame. I've never been visited or lived anywhere in the world where shame, anxiety, depression, and guilt were just more common ever. Maybe there is somewhere else, but I've never been there, and I travel a bit. I've never been, like, there just seems to be, it's spiritual, it's medical, it's, I don't know what it is, but it's here, and it's heavy, and most of you know what I'm talking about, and I'm telling you that the gospel is the power of God to save you from it and everything else. The gospel, the good news of what Jesus has done in, in, in his life and death and resurrection is not only to declare you innocent of your sins, but it is the power to save you from everything which would seek to have you. Everything 
Some of you work so hard to try and not be your parents, to try and not be that guy, whoever that guy is, or to, to, to try and find some feature of yourself and be that, right? But the gospel is the power, only the gospel, only in Jesus and what He's done, that whole thing, that whole story, that's where the power is for salvation. That's where the power is for rescue, not just to begin your Christian life, but for every moment in between. Some of you are trying so hard to wrestle yourself free from sin, and Jesus is just standing there going, just, just trust me. And you're like, no, 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 I got it. I sometimes will try and help my children with things, um, and, and two of them particularly, they'll, you know, they'll be doing an art project, or they'll be outside trying to build something, and they'll get really frustrated by it, and then I come to help, and, and it is like, you know, an angry, wounded animal that I have approached. Hey, can I help you? No. Can't you see I've got it? And I'm like, I, you don't got it, um, you know. <laughs> And it's this big knot and mess, and like, well, I could help you. No, you know, and that's. Just, but we're the same way, the same way to God. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for the salvation for all who would believe. For salvation from sin, from death, from shame, from sickness, from fear. The gospel is the power of God, and we receive it by faith. To everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Now, here Paul's not actually saying to Jewish people and Greek people, and that's it, right? If you're a good Jewish kid, to say to Jews and Greeks is to say, the gospel is the power of God for salvation to just flipping everybody, everybody. A young, old, rich, poor, black, white, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter how you voted in November, doesn't matter where you come from, doesn't matter what color your skin is, doesn't matter, you know, the size of the bank balance that you happen to have attached to your name right now. It does not matter. If you trust Jesus, if you repent of sins and believe him that he really is the son of God who really did die and rise for your sins, the gospel is power to save you too. That's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. In a world where we have been ripped apart by identity politics and then told by our art and our media that the way that we really self-actualize is to find some feature of ourselves and hold that up as highest and most determinative for who we are, to hear the news that this one story is power to save everybody is utterly anti-cultural, utterly subversive to everything we're told, and utterly true. Utterly true. It's the gospel. What makes us a spiritual family isn't because you're all the same color. Look around. You're not. It isn't because of of me. It isn't because of the band. It isn't because of our amazing facilities. That one's really funny. Um, (laughs) It's Jesus. It's the gospel of Jesus. It's what makes us who we are, and it's what will continue to make us who we are, and it's what will save us and create for us a new life in the new world that will make us who we will finally become. Nothing more, nothing less, faith in the gospel of Jesus. It's the power of God for the salvation of all who would believe, first the Jew, then the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. We care so much about our personal virtue or our social justice or all of the things that are wrong with the world animates so much of the news, so much of the way you study, so much of the way you spend your money, so much of the things you scroll through on your Facebook feed, so much of the pain and injustice and brokenness and unrighteousness of your own soul and of the world around you motivate what you do, but the gospel is the power of God for salvation to all who would believe. First the Jew and the Greek, because in it, the righteousness of God, the justice of God, the goodness of God, the rightness of God, that's where it's revealed. All of us want someone to make the world right. All of us want the hero to win. All of us want the B-flat major chord at the end of the symphony to feel like, oh, that was amazing. Like, all of us want that. It's only found in Jesus. Only in Jesus is the world going to be made right. Only in Jesus can you be declared righteous. Only in Jesus can your sins actually be forgiven and your record be wiped totally clean and you be declared right, perfect, not violator of any law, perfectly virtuous. Why? Because Jesus was perfectly virtuous for you. Some of you have dropped the ball as followers of Jesus and thought, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start well, but I'm not really going to pursue virtue. I'm not really going to pursue a better world. I'm, I'm going to you know, try and do part of this on my own. No, I'm going to give my whole life to you, God. I'm in for the whole thing. Take me. I'm yours. Terms and conditions may apply, right? Yeah? Like you've got a big asterisk next to your statement of faith. 
Because I know I'm going to trust Jesus. He is the power of God, salvation, righteousness, faith to faith, except for my money. Or except for my body. Or except for my sexuality. Or except for my my spouse. or Just whatever your thing is where you just want to keep control of that. And what I'm telling you is we must receive the good news by faith for faithfulness. For a life of faithfulness. When I was in Scotland and, and God called us to move over here, I believed him and then we acted in belief. In, in coming here, Pastor Donnie believed him and then acted in belief in, in serving in this church and stepping out in faith and being baptized today. We're going to see some people who believed him and then acted in belief. Can you imagine what this city would be like, what your campus would be like, what your world would be like, what wherever you're going back to in the summer would be, wherever you set your foot, can you imagine what that place would be like if your whole life was lived from faith for faith? If you lived your life in response to belief in the gospel, and then everything that God brought before you, be it pain, be it pleasure, be it good, or be it challenging, your response was, I'm going to trust you, God. I'm going to do what you say. I'm going to give you thanks for your provision, even when I don't see it. I'm going to believe you. I'm going to stay faithful. The power of God is powerful to save me and make me virtuous and right before you, and I'm going to live my whole life, A to Z, faith to faith. The world would be a really different place. For as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. You can equally translate this, those who are by faith righteous shall live. And I think it should go both ways. Because if you trusted Jesus for your righteousness, you'll live. And if you are righteous, you live by faith. We live by faith. We don't arrive. We, we do arrive in the new heavens and the new earth. Some of you say, well, but when is it going to get easier? When am I going to have to stop believing God for, for things? I don't know. God just keeps giving me bigger things that I have to trust him for. I had to trust him for $100. Got that. Okay, now believe me for this much. Now believe me for this much. Now believe me for your kids and your church and your city and church. And ah, because he wants to expand our capacity to trust him. He wants to expand our ability to receive from him. And the only way we get to get anything from him is by faith, which is why the author of Hebrews said, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For those who would come to him must believe that he exists and that he is the rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. We're saved by faith for faithfulness. So my story, you know, it's, it's not done. Your story is not done either. Can you imagine what your story would be like if in, instead of try harder, do better, you, you and I, we really began to believe. Not only are we saved by faith, but we're saved by faith for faithfulness. That God might use us to do something amazing in our circle of influence, in our lives, and in our city. Oh, what the world might be like. I want to pray for you today. Before we, before we celebrate the sacrament of baptism, we've got a lot of fun we're going to have. I want to pray for you. Some of you in here are, are Christians, but, and, and you started well, but you're just saying, look, my capacity to trust God has been damaged. I'm ashamed of the gospel somehow. I'm covered in fear. I've got cynicism growing like a crust over my heart. And you need prayer. I want to pray for you today. So, so let's pray.